Jesus made a statement one day. The book of Matthew. This is what he said. Matthew 20, 16. So the last shall be first. And the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. There's a difference between a call and a choosing. The gospel call goes out. It has gone out for hundreds of years. Thousands of years. It has gone out in every land. Paul the Apostle said that the gospel call has gone out in every nation under heaven in his day. And it's gone out in every nation under heaven in our day. The call. Millions have heard the call. Jesus said many are called. Many are called. But few are chosen. There's a difference. Who does the choosing? Who does the calling? And who does the choosing? The call was made by Paul, Peter, James, John, Matthew, the other disciples, unnamed apostles and unnamed disciples, and their descendants, and the third generation and the fourth generation down to us. Man makes the call. Who makes the choosing? The Lord. There's a difference. <clears throat> to me, this answer looked a lot of questions. Why isn't that person saved? Why isn't that person living for Christ? Why isn't thousands, even family members, They've heard the call. But guess what? The Lord hasn't done the choosing. We believe the Bible teaches a sovereign God. I cannot explain. I cannot even begin to answer why God does certain things and not certain things. Why he calls one and not the other. And it's a hard thing to conceive. But Jesus made this statement, many are called, but few are chosen. In Matthew or in the book of Mark, chapter 13, verses 19 and 20. He says, For in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time, neither shall be. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. And then he says, but for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, not whom he has called, but whom he has chosen, he hath shortened 
the days. In other words, those chosen ones actually was the determining factor that God shortened the days of tribulation. It was for the chosen. This is a hard message. This message is often refuted by other Christians. And they have that right to do so. But what is the answer? Why one is not saved and the other is not when both heard the call. The same call. The Bible even tells us in the book of John that Jesus chose Judas. John 13, verse 18. Tells us this. I speak not of you all. This is more or less starting in the middle of this concept. I know whom I have chosen. But that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. He says somebody is going to betray you. But not all of you. I have chosen this one man to betray me. That's hard. I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen. He was actually chosen. When was Judas chosen? Was it something that he did that determined God's choice of him to be the arch enemy of this earth to betray the Savior to the authorities? There's no indication that Judas did anything to determine God's choice. So when was he chosen? It says that the scripture may be fulfilled. That was spoken hundreds of years before Judas was born. Hundreds of years. So he was spoken of by a prophet long before he was ever conceived in his mother's womb. Is that fair? The Apostle Paul asked concerning Esau and Jacob. He says, we're not going to question the sovereignty and the choice of God. Amen. Just let God be God. Amen. He never asked us our opinion on any of his decisions. <laughs> And he never will. Even Judas was chosen to do his job. Also in the book of John, well, let's go to Matthew first. Matthew chapter 4. A familiar passage. Now, the scene in Matthew 4 is Jesus is in the northern province called Galilee. And while in Galilee, he starts his ministry. And the Bible tells us in verse 18, and Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren. Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. This was a major trade 
in Galilee. A major source of their living. How many people do you think, how many men do you think could have been there casting their nets into the sea? Two? Ten? Maybe a hundred. And he picks two. Why did he pick Peter? Why did he pick his brother Andrew? It was the choice, the divine choice of Jesus Christ. There were a lot of fishermen there that day. Before Peter arrived, while Peter and Andrew were there, and there were many there after the chief. This is what he said in verse 19. And he said unto them, Peter and Andrew, follow me, and I'm going to make you into something. You're fishing for fish out of the water. But I'm going to make you into something else. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Amen. And guess what? The Bible gives no indication whatsoever that they retorted and said, Who are you? Who, me? No, I'm not going to follow you because I've got, I've got this fish to take to market and get a little money and, and pay my bills. There, there's no record that they resisted in any way. A divine call. A divine choice. They had no choice in the matter. You agree? Amen. They had no choice. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, in a ship with their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship, and they left their dad in the ship. Pop, you finish the job. And they followed Jesus. Amen. Now, how do we explain this? Because my simple explanation is this. That the call of the Lord Jesus The call of the Lord Jesus, if he was standing here, met with the choice that had already been made in the heart and life of those men. And it connected. That's a simple explanation. Deep, call it unto deep. God had already placed in these two brethren, James and John, Peter and Andrew, God had already placed something in them that they responded in a positive manner. When they heard the call, it was not only a call, it was a choice. The choice of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And they had no human alternative. Amen. They were called. It tells us this in the book of John. Chapter 15. John 15. Verse number 16. Let's start with 15. Verse 15. 
Henceforth, I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. And then he says this. Ye have not chosen me. This is pretty simple. This is first grade language. And what's the next part? But I have chosen you. And you are no longer just going to be a servant of mine. I'm going to elevate you to friendship. Because friendship, what the Father tells me, I'm going to share with you. Now, when Jesus said these words, he was putting quite a responsibility on these men. Heavy responsibility. And he immediately wanted to quell any doubt in their minds that they had made a wrong choice in following Jesus. So he just simply says, don't worry about it, boys. You have not chosen me. I'm the one that has chosen me. I called you by the Sea of Galilee. You answered. Now, three and a half years later, he says, you heard my call. You were my choice. And folks, we have, we in this building today, if we would add up all the years, the aggravated the years, all the aggregated the years of all of us, it would amount to hundreds of years sitting in a church pew, right? Why aren't they full? Many people heard the call. Why are we sitting here? You ever thought about that? Because it was more than a call. It was God's choice. In this same chapter, John 15, Verse 18, if the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world is going to hate you. So we may as well expect it. So Jesus makes it very clear in verse 16 and verse 19. But I have chosen you. That's an awesome statement. Yes. Yeah. You look back over your life. Do any of us have anything to brag about as far as righteousness? Lord, I qualify. None of us. Well, we never, you know, killed anybody. We're out of jail. Uh, we've never, you know, robbed banks or anything like that. So we must be pretty good people. No.
Jesus says, Jesus said, I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to call sinners to repentance. And he chose. He called. He chose. Jesus said the parable of the sower and the seed. Man went out to sow the seed of the gospel. And it fell on four different types of ground. One ground was, it didn't produce anything. Some ground produced something, but it was among rocks. A lot of obstacles. It didn't produce anything. It died. Next ground, the sun came up, scorched it. Then there was the fourth ground. It was good ground. It was all the same seed. Amen. Right? Amen. What made the difference? The soil. It was the soil. Now, think about this one. I don't even want to say it, but some people are not good soil. Did you hear what I said? Amen. Some People are rocky soil. And they make a an initial start. And the rocks crowd out the growth of that plant. Others, the sun comes up and scorches that little plant, that little seed. And it dies. Can't even make it to noon. And it's dead. But when seed is sown on good ground. Folks, there have been billions and billions of dollars spent on evangelism. <laughs> right? Amen. Billions and still asking for millions and billions. And Jesus makes the statement Will I find any faith on the earth when I return? The nation in which Quote, there's a church on every corner. That's us. And we are wicked. Amen. We are that one. Yes. yes. Acts chapter 1. Verse 1, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandment unto the apostles. What apostles? Whom he had chosen. Whom he had chosen. <clears throat> he only shared the secrets of the kingdom of God with whom he had chosen. How many met in the upper room? How many people? 120. But it tells us that he preached to the multitudes. He was compassionate with them. 
He healed their sick. He raised their dead. Blind eyes were opened. The lame walked. But when he got right down to it, after his resurrection, in this 40-day span, he began to share truth only unto 11 men. 11. Because Judas was out of the picture. Did the Apostle Paul have a choice on the road to Damascus that day? He had no choice. I mean, that I picture the Apostle Paul, who was known as Saul at that time, as being a very intelligent, but yet arrogant individual. He knew it all. He knew the law. He trained under the chief rabbi, Gamaliel. He probably had degrees like the alphabet behind his name. And he had papers in his hand. And he was going down to Damascus because he was going to arrest somebody. All of a sudden, he hears a voice. Saul, Saul, why persecuteth thou me? And he knew that it was Jesus. Amen. Because he responded. Yes. Who art thou, Lord? Paul, the Lord told Ananias, go anoint him, because he's my chosen vessel. I call him on the road to Damascus, but he's more than called. He heard it. He responded. He's chosen. Acts chapter 10. Thirty-nine. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him... God raised up the third day and showed him openly not to all the people but unto witnesses what? Chosen before God. Chosen before God even unto us. Jesus died and he rose again. And he was shown openly, verse 40. But not all people could see it. The witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That witness did not resonate or resonate, I have you say that, with all people. But only to those that were chosen. Why, Lord? For God so loved the world. John 3.16. Why isn't the world saved? Didn't Jesus 
make the call one day in Matthew chapter 11. When he said, come unto me, all ye who are weary, heavy laden, I'll give you rest. The call has been made. Folks, I don't know how to reconcile all these scriptures with my human understanding. It's beyond my human understanding. But I have seen it played out in the church world. And I've been in church all my life. I've seen many come and many go in different church settings throughout the years. And Lord, the only thing I can say. They heard the call. And they responded. As rocky soil. Or soil that. Wouldn't produce the cause of the scorching of the sun. And then I've seen good soil. Good soil. Produce good plants. Jesus said. Let's turn back to the book of John. Chapter 17. You know, I have entitled this message by invitation only. Amen. By invitation only. What does he say here? Just hold your finger in John 17. Go back to John 6. Verse 43. Well, let's start with 41. 641. The Jews then murmured to him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me <clears throat> except the Father which has sent me draw him. Whatever school of thought you're coming from, which are there's two major historical schools of thought, and I'm not even going to mention them, but one of them is free will. I make the choice to come to Christ. Well, man can make that choice. But most likely, it will be in the first three types of soil. Jesus said, I'm going to read it again, no man can come to me, or come, yeah, come to me, except the Father which hath sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's verse 43 and 44. 
But what did he say in verse 37? All that the Father hath given me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. There is where your eternity, your eternal security rests. Being given by the Father to Jesus. When the Father gives you, makes the choice, gives you to Christ, there is where your eternal security rests. Amen. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast away. But you say, Lord, what about all these people? that made the profession in the campaign, 10,000 came forward and repeated the same prayer. Did they make an intellectual choice? Did they make an emotional choice on their own? But how many in that crowd of 10,000 were chosen. You say, why, why bring all this out? Why, why teach such a thing? When Jesus loves everybody and loves everybody the same, I teach it because I see it in this book. Amen. I didn't write the book. <laughs> I'm just reading and repeating the book. And it fits church history. Yes. It does, doesn't it? Yes. It fits what I have seen Amen. in the church since I was Small boy. That was John 637. That was John 644. Let's go to verse 38. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me. I should not lose, but should raise it up at the last day. In other words, I'm going to complete my work in them and raise them up at the last day. This is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. There is where your eternal security rests. And then drop down to verse 65. Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. John 17, chapter 17, verse 2. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Jesus is praying this prayer. Verse 1 says, He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may glorify thee. And then he goes on to say, As many as thou hast given him. Yeah. 
verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men whom thou gavest me out of the world. Verse 9. I pray for them. Then Jesus makes this other statement. I pray not for the world. You hear me? How do we reconcile that with John 3.16? For God so loved the world. He says, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, because they belong to me. They're mine. And the puzzling thing about it, Jesus says this concerning people who are not perfect. And maybe they've been through a rebellious, hellish life before. But if they're chosen, he's going to clean them up and raise them up in the last day. Let's continue. Verse 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, Keep them through thy name, whom thou hast given me. Verse 12. When I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, except the son of perdition. And that was to fulfill scripture verse 24 father I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me because you love me for, before the foundation of the world These are the words of Christ himself. In John 13, we see this phrase. Thirteen one. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world unto the Father. And then it says, having loved his own. Having loved his own. Now do you think, I want to ask you a question. Is Jesus being partial? This is yes. Yes. This is no. <laughs> yes. He's being partial. What is, what's going to take place on Judgment Day? I don't know how the Lord can handle all this. I don't know. He says, having loved his own. Now, we just read a bunch of verses about being given to him. Those were his own. Having loved his own. Concerning communion. Or the last supper. In Matthew 26. We read. These words. In verse. Thirty 
6. No, not 36. Twenty-six. As they were eating, Jesus took bread. He blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. He took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. I know that what Jesus gave was a literal cup. He had a literal cup there with the fruit of the vine in the cup. And this phrase, drink ye all of it, has been interpreted different ways. Now, we believe that there was a common chalice that they used. They didn't have individual cups. Was he telling each man to drink all of it? You know, here, Peter, Drink you everything that's in the cup, and I'll refill it and give it to Andrew, and then he'll drink it, and then go to the third man. Or was he telling the group, drink ye all of it? The cup was full, and you pass it around, and when it gets back around to the last man, I want it to be empty. Whatever he meant in the natural, I want to pose this question. What did that cup mean? That was a cup representing crucifixion. It was a cup representing rejection. It was a cup representing pain. It was a cup representing Isaiah 53. It was a cup that represented abandonment. It was a cup that represented suffering and rejection and hanging on the cross. And he said, drink ye all of it. I want to pose this to every one of us. Whatever that cup represented was a lot of things. He gave it to his disciples to drink. Amen. You follow me? Yes. He's not the only one that drank the cup. So when we take this cup, this individual cup that we have, It represents death. It represents, as I said before, rejection, suffering, pain, crucifixion, mockery, scorn, and everything that they could throw in his teeth. If you be the son of God, come down. If you're the king of Israel, Come down and we'll believe you. That's what this cup represent, represented. And he gave it to his disciples and said, you drank it too. You follow me? Mm -hmm. Pretty awesome, huh? Yes. Because he said, if they hated me, they hate you too. And hatred's in the cup. Represented by the cup. But there's one other thing that this cup represents. Atonement. Amen. Amen. You're sinful. I don't care what you did. Yes. It doesn't matter. Amen. This blood is a blood of atonement. Yes. It's a blood of forgiveness. It's blood of of justification, sanctification, washing, cleansing. That's what it represents. Salvation. 
by grace. Salvation by grace through faith and not of ourselves. You know why? He said this is the New Testament, but he didn't say in your blood. What did he say? In my blood. It's his blood. Amen. Salvation is in that cup, represented in that cup. We're not Roman Catholic. We don't believe in transubstantiation. You know, there's, you know, it actually becomes the, the blood and the body of Jesus. We're not Lutherans. Consubstantiation. When you take this, you actually take in grace. No. It's emblematic. It's representation. That blood represented both the death but life for us. Amen. Amen. Amen.